It is not often that a man sees his own corpse, but I am far less interested in my own corpse than I am in yours. Prepare yourself, vampire! Death in the circle breathes life to the pillars. For every pillar, there is a token. Only with these shall they be restored. But to reach a warrior, you must first breach his ward. Find Malak and destroy him. Only then will the circle fall. With the mad mentalist Nopraptor dead, and his severed head offered to the circle, his pillar appears now cleansed. And thus, we must stalk down our next target. The ineffectual guardian, Malik. The pillar of conflict, protected by the paladin Malik. With the circle's second servant now in our sights, we once again resume our bat form and take flight towards Malik's impenetrable bastion. We arrive at the northeastern end of Vasabund, and in front of us see a previously barred path by two stone pillars make short work of them, thanks to our new weapon, the powerful mace. Again, we see sigils and stones try and block our path. Regardless, we come upon two sentries that bear sword and shield and boast fighting prowess like no other, pushing us on the back foot towards Vasabund. It's only after felling the first foe and draining him of his precious lifeblood. <laughs> Do we happen upon the second and realize the folly of our ways? The mace is best utilized with two quick consecutive strikes and thus stuns our enemies, exposing their supple throats, begging to be drank deeply. Mace Victor! Mace Victor! With the third century, we easily dispatch him thanks to our newfound technique but not before heading to a cave just to the north. The blood of ages flows so sweet. Come, drink from us. Your magic energy recovers more quickly, for our blood enhances. Exiting the cave with our newly found magical perk, we find the guards have resumed their patrol anew. Bay Victor! And as such, a push to the southeast on the back foot, fighting off one sentry before destroying another pillar and the guard that hides quite a collection of artifacts, including flays and hearts of darkness. A welcome addition to our arsenal for the battle of blood and steel, no doubt promised when facing the paladin Malik. Years ago, word reached us of a strange pestilence that had laid siege to a few remote villages far east, but the rumors failed to prepare us for the horror that was the plague. So then we realized perhaps the pillars were not to keep us out, but instead to desperately contain this plague. Worms and maggots fed upon his festering skin. The scent of tainted blood seeped through the wounds upon which they feasted. Pity. Such a waste. Good blood gone bad. And we thought the smell and stench and cry was formidable. Corhagen, my home, the finest city in all of Nosgoth, rich in vanity and conceit. I had no delusions as to the welcome I would receive. Wary, we see bodies scattered about, infected with the plague. Entering the first building, we find a vampire coven had set up shop, or at least two coffins. Perhaps as they were empty, they fled due to the plague and lack of fresh blood. However, the full breadth of the horrors we witness is almost incomprehensible as a cart of the deceased, bodies overflowing, lay abandoned in the street, a morbid promise of things to come. Death and disease stalked these streets. Bodies lay most in the very spots in which fate had taken them. A perfect homecoming. The local denizens that meet us don't even look in our direction as if they have enough trouble on their plate. Perhaps worse yet, one of the Harlequin Pied Pipers plays its flute, bringing forth more of the dead in broad daylight as he happily marches behind us. 
as we're forced to answer his necrotic song with the torrent of energy bolts. However, we must confess the last of the undead does not fall so easily, and we begin to question the efficacy of our mace against the recently re-risen. <laughs> Heading just to the north, we find an empty dwelling save for two dead bodies that lay limp on the ground. And then to the west, the building adjacent boasts a similar scene, save for a single barrel against the northern wall, which bequeaths us a single heart of darkness. Heading outside, we quickly realize entering buildings respawns enemies. Congruently, so have our necrotic friends. Leveraging deception over full frontal force, we once again employ the disguise spell. Heading past the Harlequin uninterrupted and into the Repel Dungeon, the first of three found in Corhagen. Heading through the western door, we find our disguise spell does not aid us as we had once hoped. Forced against the back wall, we dodge biting blade and crushing mace alike, all the while slipping between arrows. In the room above, we find ourselves in a similar predicament, as a trio of cutthroats stalks us down. Pressing forward, we quickly discover we have also pressed our luck too far with the disguise spell, forced to resume our vampiric form and fight our way out of the cacophony of weapons as they close in. <coughs> with darkness seeping into the corners of our vision. The heart of darkness. And it's only thanks to the heart of darkness our life has been spared momentarily. With our attackers still in full force, we begin to dodge and weave between them, drinking deep from the life-giving blood of the heart. It seems, facing Malik's minions, the guardian of conflict, that there is no dodging battle, but instead, Embrace conflict entirely. Stalking down our victims, we employ the many flays at our disposal, rending flesh from bone and savoring their screams with undue glee. <laughs> heading south, we find ourselves back in the main hall that we started and are now heading east. The undead return to bar our path and the many physical traps that impede us, becoming more numerous the more we travel. Heading through a western door, we find more sorcerers hurling their accursed energy bolts, and realize that close quarters we perhaps cannot dodge them, and thus we shift back into our wolf form, attempting to feed but still being struck by the many projectiles. Our best hope at survival is making a mad dash through the rest of the room, once we have come nearly full circle, we locate the promised Repel Spell card. Invoking this spell cloaks me under a protective aegis. Whatever spell is cast at me will be reflected back at the caster, leaving me unharmed. It will only last for a short time, however, before leaving me vulnerable once more. Testing our latest spell, indeed we are encapsulated inside a magical barrier and heading into the southern room quickly discover that the sorceress whose energy bolts had plagued us so much now harmlessly deflected, turning our own defensive desire into a formidable offense. As we exit the dungeon and back into the rotting remnants of the town, it should be noted that in development, the Repel Dungeon was one of the areas that was known to have undergone significant changes. It was not originally used to house the Repel spell in the Alpha, but instead for two deleted spells, Force Shield and Magic Absorb, with an entirely different Repel Dungeon present later in the Alpha. By the time of Beta, however, this had changed, and entries found in a second developer's level select in the Alpha could suggest that there were originally three separate dungeons for Force Shield, Magic Absorb, and Repel, which were gradually consolidated. Inside one of the unmarked taverns, we find four items in barrels. Keeping with the town's aesthetic, the tavern's inhabitants are littered about, and as we leap behind the bar, we see not even the publican or his wife survived the deadly plague. Outside, under the commoner's disguise once more, we head to the northeast and find another empty domicile. The residents housing a stack of rotting corpses and a single flay for us to collect. 
Crossing the thoroughfare outside and to the east, we enter another unmarked building. Its residents, though, are alive, or in a manner of speaking, as we realize these are the dark priests that we had encountered previously. However, they too are fooled by the disguise spell, and moving through the northeastern door of what appears to be some form of church, we then find another save point and respite before we head deeper into this darkened, unknown dungeon. It's a few rooms to the north, we discover a painting of Cain marking the ground, wearing a formidable plate of necrotic armor. This, of course, denotes the Bone Armor Dungeon. As we head inside, we're set upon by two skeletons, and by pressing a switch on the northern wall, we escape their assault unscathed and can head through the northern door. However, we find something peculiar floating towards us. Unsure of the shadows on the ground and their meaning, humanoid wraiths slash at us from the blackened puddles. We can only imagine what type of abyss had spawned them. Thankfully, with enough damage, they dissipate in a scream. In a room just above, as we dodge more of the shadow dwellers, we find a new obstacle. Ice that adds unwanted momentum underfoot. Superficially, this seems innocuous enough. Experience has taught us that in time, our opinion of this will surely change for the worse. Dodging more spirits to hit a switch on the northern wall, we drink deep from another victim, but are then pressed against said wall, barely able to see what we're fighting thanks to a bony umbrella above. Now moving under the archway to the east, five more undead block our path, and we wonder when will we find respite from these hordes of the undead? <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't appear anytime soon. Crossing paths with a garishly garbed, hovering skeleton summoner, the source of these unrelenting shades. In return, we gift the summoner a flurry of energy bolts that tear his being apart. in an equally showy plume of viscera and death. Weary from our constant battle with the undead, we resume our wolf form, forced to face a deluge of spikes, whether from the wall or placed haphazardly underfoot, only our leap saving us from the searing spears. However, we have just moved from the frying pan and into the freezer. As our wolf form had gifted us more speed, the added dexterity now works against us as ice adding momentum underfoot means we slide into barbed death that surrounds us. Thankful for the reprieve with the bevy of beauties that gift us their blood, through an eastern door there is another summoner. This time of the skeletons that stalk us down, we try in vain to scratch our way through the northern door and exit the room, realizing that we must face them in combat if we are to resume our journey. That goes for the Sordid Summoners too, who erroneously believed they were safe on their spiked perch, but there's nothing a few flays won't fix. The room to the north bears a peculiar ornamental design embedded in the floor. More skulls than we can care to count and looks to be a gateway for the undead. Bay Victor! Bay Victor! <laughs> Exhausted from the sheer onslaught of undead, in the room above is the promised bone armor cart. Before collecting it, we somewhat wisely light up our surroundings in case our pilfering of the artifact disturbs more undead. Lower forms of undead fall swiftly to deception. With the bone armor, they are not as eager to challenge me. They more than a little eager for a reprieve from the onslaught, we equip the bone armor, only to be nearly savaged by the remaining ghoul. However, as we enter the next room to the south, we find that the shades are somewhat pacified. Testing said armor on the next batch of wandering skeletons, they too dismiss us, passive in their patrol. To the south, as we pussyfoot over a block of ice, the remaining skeleton all but ignores us exiting the dungeon and welcomed by piles of corpses again. We resume our other disguise, this time for the living. 
We make our way to the closest open building to the north and find more corpses in a main dining area. To the east, we then discover another painting on the floor. This time, a villagers being destroyed by the plague. Opening the barrels above, we find out why. This cleanses my body of any dangerous poisons. Quite useful with all the filth I find myself surrounded by. Making our way downstairs, we find that the spirits have lease. However, due to our new bone armor, the ethereal maidens largely leave us unmolested. While searching the various rooms, we find a new item to add to our repertoire. A medley of death and evisceration. Let fate choose my enemy's demise. After unlocking the previously barred northern door, we take the teleporter into Corhagen's third and final dungeon, which is aptly named Inspire Hate. As we hunt the paladin of conflict, we so see a sigil on the ground of two swords clashing, a promise of the potential power we can find inside. But first, we must take care of the errant guard that wields a scimitar that extends as if it was a polearm. Making bridging the gap with our mace nigh impossible, we instead fall back on one of our infamous flays. Heading through the northwestern room in our disguised form, we decide... Perhaps subterfuge is not our greatest ally in the dungeon of conflict itself and see a large room full of guards ambling about. As we send the stairs past the Inspire Hate mural, the spikes that had previously divided us from our enemies all but disappear. This spell allows me to exploit the petty prejudices of man. Minor grievance would escalate to murderous rage, and oh, the sweet terror when the spell wore off and they saw their hands covered with their neighbor's blood. With the way that Cain sells it, we would be fools to not test out this hate-fueled magic, heading to the east and west and stirring up the polearm-bearing guards. With the hornet's nest stirred successfully, we unleash the spell on our enemies. And chaos ensues. We didn't realize just how effective the Inspire Hate spell would be. And after the guards have dealt with the undead, their unhinged bloodlust is turned on one another. All the while, we're free to skirt past them unimpeded. And although there are several more rooms inside said dungeon that allow us to test this ability, we must continue our quest to hunt down the paladin Malik. And so we exit the dungeon and find ourselves in another plague-filled residence in the eastern side of Corhagen. Emerging outside, we pause a moment to have a much needed drink from one of the healthy blood bags ambling about. Heading north, exiting Corhagen and the pervasive plague, we find the forest itself opens up, presenting the base of a mountain. To the east is the Termagant Forest. However, our pathway is blocked by thick trees and shrubbery, and so we leverage our lupine form, bounding up the mountain and finding a bat flight point as a view of our enemy ahead. Malik's Bastion, perched defiantly on the mountain top. Black as night against the blanket of snow. What manner of man would choose a land so harsh and utterly devoid of life? With no way to scale the mountain by foot, we take flight in our bat form. Arriving at Malik's sterile fortress, we find the main doors are open, as if the paladin awaits our arrival, and so, fleeing the frigid cold, we enter to an ominous warning. I know you are here, demon. The stench of death clings to you. Just ahead, we collect a heart of darkness while remarking. The interior was as cold and sterile as the snow outside with empty suits of armor and sharp, cruel steel lining the walls. Indeed, 
Kane's appraisal of the tower is wholly accurate. The paladin Malik being the aspect of conflict is in favor of sword and steel, spike and death and all manner of physical harm. Exploring the fortress to the west, we find a much needed save point. Exiting to the main area and unlocking the eastern door, dodging one of the Blades of Death, our trials to overcome Malik's gauntlet begin in earnest. It should be noted that Malik's fortress is indeed 90% spiked pits, floating spiked balls of death, and swinging axes that generally are looking to eviscerate Kane, and thus we will be skipping most of it due to the fact that it's highly repetitive and, well, painful for all parties involved. Speaking of painful, we happen upon one of Malik's many sentries, this time some form of knight that wields a sword and is highly resistant to our new spiked mace, and they're not even able to be stunned by the new weapon. And so, dutifully, we fling energy bolts at our new foes until they explode in a plume of flesh. <laughs> they vict us indeed. Exiting the room through a northern door and collecting a blue energy ball, which will aid with our shocking spell. We find ourselves in the next room of note, set upon by a duo of knights. Realizing that they physically have the upper hand, and there's too many to contend with with our energy bolts alone, we hastily decide to allow the death card spell to decide our enemy's fate. with our foes now a fine dust on the ground. We pause to take inventory of our surroundings and see. The large room houses a strange machine in its center and a glowing orb that seems to be its power source and instinctually know it must be destroyed. The globe powered the machinery. With its destruction, the deafening shrieks of the machine ceased to echo throughout the bastion. It was now time to silence the machine's maker. You try my patience, fledgling. Care to try my blade instead? Exiting Malik's main tower, we find ourselves back outside between the snowy ramparts. Heading west across the frozen tundra, we find two sentries outside of the second tower and remark. The guards at the gate offered no resistance. They were frozen solid, and dead as they stood, their flesh welded to the cold metal of their armor. My eyes yearned from lack of contrast. My mouth ached for want of blood. In this cold wasteland, food was scarce, and my hunger grew. Making our way to the second tower, as we head inside, we're confronted with a gruesome sight. A corpse held court on a tattered throne, grinning malignantly at me through blackened teeth. It is not often that a man sees his own corpse. It is a sobering experience. But I am far less interested in my own corpse than I am in yours. Prepare yourself, vampire! With Malik's corpse thoroughly through with his empty threats, or should I say hollow, like his bones, we head through the western teleporter and find a litany of items housed in four chests. A welcomed boon for the battle to come. Teleporting back into the main hall and crossing paths with Malik's corpse once more, we then venture through the eastern teleporter and see a much needed save shrine awaits. With our wounds healed, we steal our resolve heading through the northern door past two more sentries into a long hall lined with armor. And it's there Malik waits to meet us in battle. Bay Victus! <laughs> Not unlike Malik's lesser guardians, our mace once again bounces off his armor, and as it is hollow, it does not stun him whatsoever. Frustrated, we begin to back up and look for alternative routes, flinging barbed flays at his metal carapace to no avail as they pass harmlessly through. Sensing Malik, the aspect of conflict demands an honest duel. We switch back to our sword to great effect. Bay Victus! With the succession of successful swipes, four to be precise, we knock Malik back and he grunts in pain. 
Knocked back for a third time, Malik falls helplessly to the floor. Oh, so we thought. Once reassembled, Malik resumes his attack, now with renewed vigor and a new element. Well, it seems in Malik's desperation, he's not above utilizing projectiles. However, we are not without our own defenses. Both Malik's physical and energy attacks are deflected away harmlessly, and we resume our own barrage with our blade. <coughs> <laughs> Succumbing to our onslaught, Malik falls again for a final time, and we believe ourselves the victor, somewhat prematurely. The air around us begins to crackle with energy that Malik draws into himself as he emanates a rolling tidal wave of concussive power that would kill us on our feet, and it tears apart the suits of armor that stand on the floor, forcing us to flee into the teleporter and away from certain death. This concludes our battle with the Guardian of Conflict, for now. Havoc and Malice, their presence in my hands keeps me from employing magic. Yet rest assured, they do little to hamper my relish for slaughter. With newfound weapons in hand, we leave the confines of Malik's Bastion in search for a new means of revenge. <laughs> <laughs>